The children on the left have just spent a happy time exploring a farm in England, meeting animals, smelling the soil, learning from the farmer. They've now sat down in a barn to sketch out some ideas about the farm as ecosystem. Such an inspiring way to learn about nature and farming. It made me think we adults need experiences like this too. My name is John Thankara. I write and curate events about design and sustainability, and I've spent 30 years trying to bring the abstract subject of sustainability to life. Inspired by those school students, I'm now developing the idea of a platform called Hour of Ecology that will be a gateway to nature connection for people like you and me. In this short video, I'll try to explain why we need Hour of Ecology, what kind of gateway experiences it involves, and how we can organize it. To explain why we need an Hour of Ecology, I need to take you back 28 years for a short detour. That's when I first was told by this eminent scientist, Leo Janssen, about the challenges we face in terms of climate, biodiversity and our survival as a species. Professor Janssen told me that we humans are over-consuming 20 times more resources than the planet can carry. This deficit, he called it Factor 20, means we must meet our everyday needs using 5% of the energy and material throughputs we're using now. Wow! Factor 20? Dramatic numbers. No time to waste. So all fired out, I set out to spread Leo Janssen's warnings to people in the design world and beyond. And I spent at least a decade wagging my finger at diverse groups and saying, this cannot go on. The trouble is it did go on, I mean. In the absence of guidance on what practically to do, my finger wagging and fear mongering caused much shoulder shrugging, but no actual change. For a while I became confirmed as a doomer. I dreamed of heading for the hills in a pickup truck filled with guns and peanut butter. But then, thanks to some life-changing experiences, which I'll tell you about in a moment, the penny finally dropped. People don't behave differently because you tell them to. We don't behave better when told we are killing the planet or betraying future generations. People don't behave differently when you say, we're on a huge crisis, be scared, oh, and turn off your phone charger at night. I learned this the hard way. These kinds of proclamations are not just ineffective, they're exhausting, enervating. There's another reason, apart from the stubbornness of human nature, why 50 years of alarming climate science has had so little effect. We live in a media-saturated desert of the real. Just look how much content is added to the internet in one minute of an average day. Most of that content has nothing to do with climate or biodiversity. Is it any surprise, given distraction this intense, that ecological indifference has replaced a sense of connection with the living world? Some people in the environmental movement told me along the way that storytelling is more effective than scientific facts or activism. And I would like to think that's true. I mean, I'm a writer, after all. But in my experience, at least, stories on their own struggle to be heard let alone remembered or acted on amid that media maelstrom. Are we thinking too hard, perhaps, and feeling too little? In my own case, I probably did spend too much time concocting plans and concepts and strategies. Ideas, in other words, at the expense of paying close attention to the nature all around me. This lesson finally sank in when I came across The Rhythm of Being by Spanish priest and philosopher Raymond Panikkar. The destruction will stop, he said, when we see nature differently, relate differently, understand our purpose here differently. I took that to mean on reflection, we don't need more messages, more concepts, let alone more instructions. What we need are moments of caring, 
connection and relationship to nature. That's how we can best reconnect with our innate built-in empathy for living systems, not in a classroom and probably not online. Martin Buber, like Raymond Panikkar, another philosopher, certainly thought so. Having spent a lifetime exploring what it means to be alive, Buber concluded, all real living is meeting. Imagination and ideas are important, Buber agreed, but authentic existence involves encounter in the real world with other individuals, living systems, even with apparently inanimate objects. The advice of these wise individuals is consistent. What we need, what we yearn for, is connection. Connection with each other, connection with place, and above all, connection with the living. Learning about ecology therefore involves a different way of being and not just a new way of thinking. It cannot happen only in classrooms or in design studios. And that's why I believe that our efforts now should include embodied experiences of connection with living systems. Experiences that, by changing how we relate to nature physically, change how we act. So this is what Hour of Ecology is about. It's a practical campaign in two phases. Phase one is about what we're calling gateway experiences to nature connection. And I'll share some examples of those that have changed me in a moment. Phase two is a wider range of courses and experience for those of us who want to go deeper. These two phases would be enabled and supported by a platform and I'll describe some different ways that that could work in a moment. So, let me explain what I mean by gateway experiences. These people, for example, are on a walk through a peri-urban wasteland outside Marseille. Only they are learning that it's not a wasteland at all. As a botanist who's guiding them explains, it's full of life if only you look closely. This walk, guided by an app, transformed my understanding of how geological processes and deep time have shaped the places we inhabit. With a script by Dr. Stefan Harding, the app takes you on a guided walk in which each step you take in the real world corresponds to stages in the 4.6 billion years of Earth history. The people in this scene are on a rewilding course in Wales. They're learning about our changing relationship with nature, ecological aspects of rewilding, land management and financial issues. Drawing on the emerging practice of relational ecology, this kind of experience reawakens our empathy not just with nature but also with each other. This group is being guided on a learning journey by the Bioregional Learning Centre. They're discussing, along the way, what would make this place more resilient? Who's making change happen now? The walkers meet people doing work that, until then, had received relatively little attention. This kind of learning journey is therefore more about fact-finding. It's also an exercise in attention, connection and relationship. Another walk, Walking the Forest, has only just started, but will last 10 years. The artist, Lucy Neal, has conceived an artwork that culminates in planting a new woodland by 2028. Her long-term vision expands our time horizon to keep the well-being of future generations in mind throughout. Pockets of vitality can be found everywhere in cities too, if only we choose to look. More Than Weeds, for example, engages urban citizens in embodied ecological practice. By noticing plants literally at our feet, people experience connection, patterns and context in new ways, even in the dustiest downtown. Also in the city, but on a much larger scale, Robert Sullivan curates bio-blitzes at fresh kills on the outskirts of Manhattan. Once a vast trash heap, it's now a park. Hands-on exploration by the bio-blitzers 
Hamas is evidence that ecological vitality persists, even in trash. Garbage heaps, in fact, are alive with billions of microscopic organisms. Fresh Kills is a place to witness change, Sullivan explains. It's a giant viewing station for ecological adaptation. Once you start to look, there's a global underworld of trash watchers out there. This composting project is by the Rice Brewing Sisters Club in Korea. The sisters also run amazing fermentation workshops because for them, composting and fermentation are naturally connected processes. There's been a lot of talk in recent times about soils. It started out as yet another crisis. If we don't take care of soil, the headlines read, we'll all starve. Thankfully, a more positive narrative has now emerged. We're transitioning from the oil age to the soil age. It no longer makes sense to think of soil as dirt. Healthy soil is an ecosystem, teeming with life. Caring for soil is caring for life. In my own case, when I started making a compost heap, I couldn't bear the thought of breaking up the vibrant community of worms and other creatures that evolve. So my compost heap has become a worm sanctuary. The tipping point in my relationship to soil was on the island of Grinda in the Stockholm archipelago. An artist suggested that we do a soil tasting ceremony. So we scavenged round the island looking for plants with tasty looking berries and leaves. We also took a sample of the soil where the plant was growing. We made a tisan out of the leaves and berries and compared its taste to the taste of the soil. That was an embodied experience. It created a feeling of shared aliveness. And guess what? Ever since then, I really have cared about soil. In the years since that moment on Grinda, I've discovered a whole wondrous array of people reconnecting with the land in new ways. Here in southern Italy, I learned how the Vazap movement curates social meetings. Farmers, activists, policymakers and others discuss what unites them and agree on practical steps for their region. It's a super simple format, but as an event it's beautifully designed. For me, these gateway experiences, these moments of caring and relationship, made me realise how little I know of the nature that surrounds me. They triggered a yearning for more, and it turns out I'm not alone in this feeling. A growing number of people is getting involved in earth repair, ecological restoration, rewilding and civic ecology in cities. The urban-rural to-do list on the left is one menu of the activities we can reconnect with if we want to go deeper. These are different ways in which people are already learning how to do ecological design, ecological restoration, agroecology, watershed recovery, and the others on that list. So this is our idea for phase two of Hour of Ecology, which will seek out and curate longer workshops and experiences that, for the most part, are already happening. They will be tagged by place, so you can find something near where you live or work. And by participating, you'll experience firsthand how to explore resources in a place, projects and individuals that have been overlooked, how to talent spot emerging solutions, and thirdly, how to work with people from other disciplines, such as ecologists and botanists. Everyone using the platform will be able to rate courses they've been on, and submit additional ones. The platform will also enable support by coaches and mentors, and maybe most important, peer-to-peer -peer support. To whet your appetite for these Phase 2 offerings, I'll show you a few more examples. Here in Spain is a group of ecosystem restorers. Ecosystem restoration camps were only founded in 2016 but they've now already been established in 19 countries around the world. The woofing movement is another reinvention of back to the land. These woofers in Colombia are in a reciprocal relationship with a place that they might once have visited as a tourist for a few days. The sites where they work for weeks or months are spaces of understanding and sharing. As with the restoration camps, 
Woofing is shaped by new values, attention to nature, a culture of hospitality, relationship with place. This group is restoring a river in southern England. Hundreds of river recovery and dam removal projects are around the world. They often involve pro-am collaboration like you see here, professionals and volunteers working together. In Iceland, hiking and knitting tours involve workshops about the traditional ways and techniques of the country. And as with food projects, this kind of experience makes a direct embodied connection between what we wear and how we treat the land. In the same spirit, in this learning village, being developed by the artist Henrietta Val, diverse activities are connected in a place where they also help each other. Wetland restoration, fibre crafts, new livelihoods and other activities. Here is a back to land summer school that I helped to run in Sweden. It also takes a bioregional approach. The design focuses on food and relationships and how to be as well as what to do in a food system context. Here in southern Italy, a rural hub called Casa Netral connects local citizens with diverse experts to help revitalize old villages. They discover what is and explore what if. They enable people to connect with nature and with each other in artful new ways. All these activities need to be curated and supported. That's why my friends in Italy, together with colleagues around Europe, have founded a school for village hosts. They learn by doing it how to seek out neglected or overlooked assets and how to design services that connect these assets together. These gateway experiences and longer courses already exist for the most part. They don't have to be invented. There are hundreds more out there. But they're not always easy to find and they're not always set up to welcome volunteers. This is where an Hour of Ecology platform comes in as the infrastructure to connect up the dots. In looking for dot connecting models to learn from, Code.org has been an inspiration. When they launched Code.org in 2013, its founders explained computer science is foundational for success in any 21st century career. Reading those words made me sit up straight. If code is foundational, surely too is ecology. In the case of Code.org, the gateway experience, Hour of Code, is designed to demystify computer science, show that anybody can learn the basics, and broaden participation in the field. It's a simple model, and seven years on, nearly two million teachers offer classes, share project ideas and enable community, 56 million students are enrolled, and all this has happened just in eight years. So inspired by that example of code.org, one option for our ecology is to build our own platform. Such a move can involve many activities as you see in the picture here. Financing, legal, curriculum development, governance, community engagement. In an ideal world, an Hour of Ecology core team would also include a, a curator, a producer, an editor, a librarian and so on. But a platform on this scale is probably for later. Another easier scenario would be to partner with a travel platform. Airbnb, for example, has a mature platform up and running called Airbnb Experiences. It already includes nature connection activities. Another possible way would be to partner with a walking site. In the UK, for example, Slowways walking routes use existing paths to connect every village and city across the land. One could well envisage adding Hour of Ecology experiences to such routes. Or maybe what we could do is partner with a network of existing social and ecological projects. Le Colibri in France, for example, maps hundreds of place-based social and ecological enterprises. These do not have to be created. The maps already exist. 
Another approach would be to partner with a nature conservation platform. The distinguished American designer, Hugh Doubly, has already developed this prototype for a nature connection platform that would provide a conversation space for members, help members find each other, and connect and create projects. Or a favorite of mine may be possible is to partner with a live streaming platform in China. There, urban-rural reconnection is a dynamic feature of the country's recent development, and 300,000 farmers already communicate directly with the people in the city who eat their food. There's even a Taobao University, a film and theatre kind of cohort of professionals who help farmers animate the stories they tell about their produce and their lives. Work has already started collecting more such examples. We identified 60 living classroom examples for one project, land-based learning at different parts of China and more globally. A related possibility would be to partner with a library belonging to an institution. Librarians, after all, are expert at selecting and sorting information, especially when it crosses disciplinary borders. In exploring these different options for a platform, two patterns have emerged so far. First, that the design of a platform will vary from context to context. It's not a global thing. The second lesson is that we should probably look first for partners amongst anchor institutions that already exist. Libraries, local museums, cafes or corner shops. So to conclude, earlier in this talk, I quoted the theologian Martin Buber, all real living is meeting. And that's what Hour of Ecology is all about, only with one small addition, meeting all of life, not just human life. The destination of such a journey cannot be known in advance, but it's not an empty road. On the contrary, as I've shown you, there are thousands of local projects out there living alternatives to the current mainstream system. There are also many experts for whom environmental education for adults, as well as for children, is their life's work. We need to work with them and not reinvent the eco-literacy wheel. But saying that these projects and teachers exist is one thing, connecting with them is another. We can't just knock on their door and demand, teach me everything you know. I've mentioned some ideas of partnerships that could enable these connections to be made, but this is an ongoing conversation. If you'd like to be part of it, do please get in touch. And thank you for your attention. Thank you.